Section 8.5, direct and limit comparison tests of infinite series of positive terms. Okay, before we start, let me make a comment about notation. So we've been working with infinite series with our summation notation. So for example, the infinite series n equals 1 to infinity a sub n, which we know means a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3 plus so on. And we've made the observation several times now that it's the and so on part, uh, which is what I've been calling the tail of the series that really determines convergence or divergence. That is, a finite number of terms at the beginning of the series doesn't really have anything to do with whether the overall infinite series converges or diverges. Okay, therefore, from here on out, when I'm making a statement generally about infinite series and their convergence or divergence, I'm just going to write a blank summation symbol with an a sub n, and I'm going to leave off uh, the index part that tells me where the n value starts and goes to infinity, because if I'm making a general statement about convergence, I know where I start this series really doesn't matter. And so just to make things a little quicker and easier to write, I'm just going to write summation a sub n without the index value starting at 1 or any other number. And it'll just be understood that really what I'm referring to in the large is the behavior of this infinite series uh, in regards to the tail. All right, so direct comparison test, the first of our two convergence tests, and probably the simplest of all comparison tests, although not always the simplest to use, but definitely the simplest to understand why it's true, that is. So let's let the infinite series a sub n and infinite series b sub n both be series of positive terms. Suppose that the infinite series b sub n is convergent and a sub n is less than or equal to b sub n, let's say for all n. Now, of course, disclaimer there, I know actually that even if this a sub n is only less than or equal to b sub n for sufficiently large n, then what I'm about to state will also be true. So that means if this was not true for, let's say, n equals 1 up through n equals 100, but starting at 101, this was always true, then what I'm about to write will also be true. So again, it, it refers to the tail of this infinite series. But to make it easy, let's suppose that a sub n is less than or equal to b sub n for all n, and that b sub n converges. Then in that case, the infinite series of the a sub n's also converges. Okay, now think about it. If I know that when I sum up all the b sub n's, that infinite series converges, which means I get a limit when I take the limit of the sequence of partial sums. Well, that means I'm adding up a bunch of b sub n's, and when I do, I get closer and closer to L. Well, that definitely means that if I add up a bunch of a sub n's, where each one of those a sub n's is less than or equal to b sub n, then one thing is for sure, I can definitely say that this infinite series uh, does not equal infinity. That is, it can't diverge in that way. If every one of these a sub n's is smaller than every one of those b sub n's, and when I add up the b sub n's, I actually get closer to something, then it's not possible to add up things that are smaller and get a sum that's bigger than L or to exceed L. Now, that's not enough to guarantee on its own that a sub n converges, 
but that is what I've set up here in the theorem. So the question is, why am I guaranteed convergence on a sub n? And so let's prove that part. So proof. Well, since the b sub n converges, the sequence of partial sums let's say that's called S sub n, where of course what I mean by sequence of partial sums is that S sub n is the sum of the first n terms of this B sub n series converges. That is our basic definition after all for convergence of an infinite series. An infinite series converges means that the sequence of partial sums of that infinite series converges. Okay, note that since each b sub n is positive, and this is the key part, this is why these comparison tests apply only to series of positive terms. Well, what happens when you add up b1 plus b2 plus b3 and so on, and each one of these numbers is positive? Well, that means every time you add another term, you're guaranteed that the new sum will be no smaller than the previous sum. That is, this is an increasing, or let's say non-decreasing sum. So whatever happens when I have b1 up through bn minus 1, when I add the next term in this series, this is going to be a little bit larger if b sub n is positive. OK, that means this sequence of partial sums is an increasing sequence. So I'll just say since each bn is positive, the sequence of partial sums is increasing. OK, so let's put those two together. So note, we have that the sequence of partial sums is convergent and increasing. Okay, what does that remind us of? Well, a few sections ago we had a theorem that said if a sequence was convergent and monotonic, which this sequence is, then that sequence is bounded. So these two put together say that this sequence of partial sums is bounded. Okay, suppose T sub n sequence is the sequence of partial sums for the A sub n series, the other series that we're looking at. Okay, again, what do I know about each A sub n? It's less than or equal to each B sub n. So what does that tell me about the partial sum, the nth partial sum of the A sub n series? Well, if you're just adding up the first n terms of the a sub n series, and each one of those terms is less than or equal to each of the first n terms in the b sub n series, their partial sums also are related that way. That is, the t sub n has to be less than or equal to the s sub n. Okay, what did we just say about the s sub n sequence? It's bounded. That's what we said right here. Okay, if S sub n is bounded and T sub n is less than that, then that means T sub n is bounded. Okay, again, what are all of the A sub n's? They're all positive numbers too. And of course, what did we just argue above? That if all of these numbers we're adding up are positive, then as we add more and more of them to create the sequence of partial sums, that sequence would have to be increasing. So I actually know that the sequence of partial sums for the A sub n series is also increasing. Okay, what is the big theorem from section 8.2? It's the other version of this theorem that we quoted above which is the one that says, and I'll just write this down here to remind you,
that if a sequence is increasing and bounded above, then that sequence is convergent. Well, this sequence of partial sums, Tn, is bounded and it's increasing, and it's bounded above. Okay, therefore, I can say that the sequence of partial sums of the A sub n series converges. But that's exactly the same thing as saying the infinite series of the A sub n's converges. Okay, so we knew from this assumption up here that the series comprised of the A sub n's couldn't diverge. Now we've proved that it actually has to converge if the series of the B sub n converges and A sub n is less than or equal to B sub n for every n. So let me summarize that on the next page just to uh, get us up to date with where we are. So we're saying if B sub n converges and A sub n is less than or equal to B sub n for all n, that implies that the series of the A sub n's converges. And remember that this applies to series of positive terms. So I'm making that distinction again because this is an important requirement for this theorem or this test to work. So I can't have series with terms that alternate in sign, for example. All right, now, the other part of the theorem is, let's call this part two, if the series B sub n diverges and A sub n is greater than or equal to B sub n for each n, then the series of the A sub n's diverges. And this one should be very easy for you to see. If we're saying that B sub n is greater than or equal to, I'm sorry, I've got that backwards. If A sub n is greater than or equal to B sub n for each n, and we're saying the series comprised of the B sub n's diverges, well, what happens when you add up all of these A sub n's if every one of them is greater than or equal to each of these B sub n's. Well, when you added up all the B sub n's, it diverged and went to infinity. If you add up a bunch of things that are bigger than that, or at least as big as that, that series would also have to diverge. So really what we're saying is that summation has to be greater than or equal to the summation on the right, and we know this one diverges. Therefore, the series of the A sub n's has to diverge. Okay, so to put that together with what we set up here, we're saying that if B sub n diverges and A sub n is greater than or equal to B sub n for all n, then that implies that the series of the A sub n's diverges. So you get now why we're calling this a comparison test, and this is called direct comparison because we're just simply comparing the sizes of the terms in the one series to the sizes of the terms in the other series. And what this one up here says is if we have a series that converges and we know there's another series where all the terms are smaller than that one that converges, then that smaller one also has to converge. This one down here says if we have a series that diverges, and we know the terms in another series are all at least as big as the terms in that series that diverges, then that bigger series has to diverge as well. Okay, I'll come back and do some examples here in a few minutes, but let's look at the other test first. So I'll go to a new page. So that last one was the so-called direct comparison test. This one is called the limit comparison test. and probably my personal favorite from the point of view of being the most useful. Um, I, I think this one applies to probably more series than any other test. It's just a very useful test. Uh, 
So it says again that a sub n and b sub n are both positive series. And we have three cases for this limit comparison test. And make sure you uh, make a note of this because this is a slightly expanded version of the theorem that's in the book. So case one says, if I take the limit as n goes to infinity of the ratio of a sub n to b sub n, and that limit is a positive constant. That implies that the series a sub n and the series b sub n both converge or those two series both diverge. Meaning, whatever one of the series does, the other one does the same thing. They both behave the same way. Okay, and that should sort of make sense to you if you just think simply from the relative rate of growth point of view. If I take the limit of these two and I consider them to be functions, I know getting a finite limit says they have the same relative rate growth with respect to n as n gets larger. Well, if they both grow at the same rate and one of them diverges, it would make sense that the other one would probably behave the same way. Now that's, that's a loose intuition, we're going to prove this here in a second, but that does turn out to be the reason behind why this works, case one. Uh, okay, so that's the theorem that's listed in your book. I'm going to add these two, which are slight refinements of this theorem. So if I take the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n over b sub n, and I get a limit of zero, all right, we can probably piece together what this would say. Um, if the series comprised of the b sub n's diverges, and actually I want to say converges on this one. Okay, thinking just out loud, what happens when I take the limit of the ratio of two functions and I get a zero limit? In terms of relative rates of growth, that means that the b sub n is growing faster than the a sub n. Well, thinking out loud, if the b sub n series converges and the b sub n's are growing faster than the a sub n's, or to say that in reverse, that means the a sub n's are growing more slowly than the b sub n's, then it seems plausible that when I add up the a sub n's, which are growing slower, that that sum should converge if the sum of the things that are growing larger converges. So what I can say in case two is that if when I take the ratio of these two I get a limit of zero and I know the bottom one converges, so let's call this the bottom one in this ratio, then that implies that the series of the a sub n's also converges. So you can probably guess what case 3 is going to be. If I take the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n over b sub n and I get infinity, then if the series of the b sub n's diverges, then, okay, so let's piece this one together. In this limit, I know that the a sub n is growing faster than the b sub n. Or to say that in reverse, the b sub n is growing slower. Well, if the slower growing b sub n forms a divergent infinite series, then it seems plausible that when I add up things that are growing even faster, that that series should also diverge. Okay, so these are the three cases, and again, Case 1 is the one that's mentioned in your book, and I'm adding these two refinements, which are useful ones, because it does give you an interpretation of this limit if it's zero or it's infinity. The one in your book only gives you an interpretation where that limit is a positive constant. Okay, note, an important note here,
if the limit as n goes to infinity of a n over b n equals 0 and the series of the b sub n's diverges, then you should notice that no conclusion may be made about the convergence of the a sub n series. And if you followed my logic when I described what was happening in number two up here, again, what did it mean? b sub n was growing faster than a sub n. a sub n was growing slower. If the sum of the b sub n's converged, and the sum of the slower growing a sub n's converged. Well, again, if the limit is zero down here, and I know the a sub n's are growing more slowly, and I tell you that the sum of the b sub n diverges, well, knowing that the a sub n grows slower is not enough to tell me if it's growing slowly enough to converge. I really can't make any sort of conclusion from this. Uh, so that means notice in case number three, there's a pitfall there too. If I take the limit as n goes to infinity of a n over b n, and that's infinity, and the limit, I'm sorry, if the series of the b sub n's converges, no conclusion can be made about the convergence or divergence of the a sub n's for the same logic or the same reason I just described with number two. So what I'm saying is be careful when you use number two or number three here. And I'll just tell you the way we're going to use this test here when we get to our examples in a few minutes. A sub n is the one you should think of as the one that you're going to test. It's the one that you're trying to investigate. B sub n should be the series that you know. That is the one whose behavior is known. Does it converge or diverge? So when you set up these ratios to keep it consistent for yourself, set it up that way. Put the one that you're testing in the top, put the one that you know in the bottom, and then you know if you get a limit of zero and the one in the bottom converges, that the one in the top will also converge. Same thing down here. If I put the one that I'm testing in the top, and I put the one that's known in the bottom, and I know that that one in the bottom diverges, then if I get a limit of zero, I'm sorry, I'm pointing to the wrong one, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I should be looking at this one up here. If this is the one I'm testing, and this is the one that's known, and I know that the series of the BNs in the bottom diverges, then when I get an infinite limit for this an over bn, I know the top an diverges. Okay, what's the nice thing about case number one? It doesn't really matter which one is the test one, which one is the one you know. If you get a finite limit, you simply know that these both do the same thing. So if the top diverges, the bottom diverges. If the bottom converges, the top converges. So that's why this one is, uh, is a little more foolproof. You don't have to think much about it. Okay, let's look at the proof. And let's just look at part one, and I'll just say the arguments on the other two cases are similar. But just for conciseness here, let's just do the proof of part one. So the proof of part one was, if I have the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n over b sub n, equals a positive constant, positive finite constant, then we said that implies that the a sub n and the b sub n uh, behave the same way. Okay, so what does it mean, first of all, to say that the limit of these two, or the limit of that ratio, is equal to L? Of course, that means that if I'm given some small number epsilon greater than zero, there is some n greater than zero such that if my little n is sufficiently large, so larger than that big n, uh, 
then I know that a sub n over b sub n is going to be within epsilon of that limit. Now, I can choose epsilon to be any number I like, right? That's always the idea that this epsilon is the tolerance. It's how close I want my sequence to be to my limit. So I can choose any epsilon I want. I'm going to choose a particular epsilon of L over 2. And so if I give you epsilon equals this positive number divided by 2, there is definitely some large n. So if I stay sufficiently large, then my sequence will be within L over 2 of the limit L. Okay, notice that that really says a n over b n minus L is greater than negative L over 2 and less than L over 2. Or to put it another way, that means L over 2 is less than a n over b n is less than 3 L over 2. Or to put it another way, that says L over 2 times b sub n is less than a sub n which is less than 3L over 2B sub n. And let's write that in two parts. If I look at this part, that says that A sub n is less than 3L over 2B sub n. If I look at the other part, that one says that A sub n is greater than L over 2B sub n. Okay, by direct comparison, I know that if a sub n is less than 3 over 2 b sub n, that means the infinite series of the a sub n's is less than 3 all over 2 times the infinite series of the b sub n's. Okay, what does that inequality tell me? It says that if the b sub n's converge, then of course multiplying that convergent sum times a constant gives me a constant. So this side, this right side, is convergent. And by direct comparison, if a sub n is less than this thing, and this thing forms a convergent series, then that means the series of the a sub n's is also convergent. And if that logic makes sense, then you should see this one over here on the right says the opposite. It says that if the b sub n's diverged, then of course multiplying by a constant L over 2 is still going to give you a divergent series. Well, if the A sub n is larger than L over 2 times each one of those B sub n's, then if this series diverges, this A sub n, which is larger than these, would also have to form a divergent series. In other words, this little inequality right here that comes out of your limit definition actually gives us two different inequalities. And one shows that if the B sub n's is convergent, the series of A sub n's is convergent, and the other shows divergence. So this is the idea of the proof. And without going through all the details, I'll just say that cases two and three are proved in a similar way. Okay, now to the important part, which is examples of how to use these two tests. And generally they're pretty easy, but you do have to be careful about a few little things. So let's just look at several examples and we'll start with some easy ones. So let's think about the series n equals 1 to infinity, let's say 4 over 3 to the n plus 1. And hopefully with this first example, we'll, we'll give you an idea of how to think about each of the tests when you're deciding how to apply them to a series like this. So first of all, let's think about the direct comparison test. Now, here's the logic. This series that you're trying to investigate, what are the two things you need to be thinking about trying to do? One would be showing that 4 over 3n plus 1 is larger than some b sub n where you know b sub n diverges. Because if you could do that, 
that would show that this series diverges. Or the other thing you're trying to do is to show that 4 over 3 to the n plus 1 is less than some b sub n where you know that b sub n series converges. That's the logic behind the direct comparison. You're definitely trying to show that this thing is less than something that converges or you're trying to show that it's bigger than something that you know diverges. Okay, now that should tell you something. To use the direct comparison test, I kind of have to make a guess ahead of time about what I think this series is doing. Because if I'm going to try and make a direct comparison to something, I have to think ahead of time about what I'm going to compare it to. Am I going to compare it to something that diverges or compare it to something that di converges? Now, knowing what we know about long-term behavior and limits, you should know, of course, that when I look at that function, when n is very large, I understand that that plus one term is negligible. It has nothing to do really with the relative size of 4 over 3 to the n when n is very large. Okay, meaning when n is large and I ignore that term, what I really have is 4 times 1 over 3 to the n. Okay, does the series 4 over 3 to the n converge or diverge? Well, I know that's just 4 times the series one-third to the n, and I know this part is just a convergent geometric series. It's convergent geometric with the common ratio being one-third. Okay, that tells me that this guy really compares favorably in the limit sense to a convergent geometric series. So my guess is this is convergent. In fact, we know it's convergent. Okay, what do I need you to write out to show me the test? Well, if you're going to do the direct comparison, then you have to algebraically show me exactly that 4 over 3 to the n plus 1 is bigger than something we definitely know converges. I'm sorry, um, this should be a less than because we just said we were trying to show convergence. Okay, so... What's the series we just said this compares favorably to? 4 over 3 to the n. Okay, question. For a fraction like this, if you're wanting to make it bigger, which of course is what I'm doing when I write a less than symbol here, how do you make fractions bigger? You either make the numerator bigger or you make the denominator smaller. And you do notice with this fraction, that if I keep the 4 the same, but I take away the 1, that is, if I remove this term, then this is definitely bigger than what's on the left. And we know that this series converges. And that's not something you have to prove to me. I'm okay with you quoting that. It's very obvious that that's a convergent geometric series. So direct comparison for this, if you were writing this up, would simply consist of you showing me that this general term in our series is less than this general term, and I know that general term forms a convergent geometric series. So I guess what we're saying is your write-up for this one, if you were doing this problem, would be something like note 4 over 3 to the n plus 1 is less than 4 over 3 to the n. And we know that the series 4 over 3 to the n is, let's say, convergent geometric. And that would be enough for the work for this. But why I'm saying I definitely want to see an inequality like this where you're showing the direct comparison to some series that we know clearly converges. All right, now, that's the direct comparison. What would limit comparison look like? Well, I would almost say limit comparison is, is even more obvious. 
because to come up with this 4 over 3 to the n, we really asked what happens when n gets big. And we said when n gets big, the plus 1 is really negligible. Okay, that means what? When 4, when we look at 4 over 3 to the n plus 1 for very large n, we know that 4 over 3 to the n plus 1 is just about the same as 4 over 3 to the n. In other words, the limit as n goes to infinity of 4 over 3 to the n plus 1 is really going to be the same as the limit as n goes to infinity of 4 over 3 to the n because I know that plus 1 term is negligible when n gets very, very big. Okay, that means in the limit sense, I know this guy is going to act like this guy, and I know this guy converges. And that tells me what to compare this to. Remember that in your limit comparison test, all you have to do is take the limit as n goes to infinity of the one you're checking out compared to or over something whose behavior is known. Okay, I know that 4 over 3 to the n is going to form a convergent series. And so if I do the limit of this ratio and I get a finite positive limit, that tells me the series comprised of these terms behaves the same way as the series comprised of these terms. Okay, now of course when I take this limit, uh, what do I get? I get the limit as n goes to infinity. The 4's cancel out and I get 3 to the n over 3 to the n plus 1. And of course I can see right away that with these both being 3 to the n, that limit's going to be 1. And that is a finite positive limit. That tells me that this series, 4 over 3 to the n plus 1, behaves the same as the series 4 over 3 to the n, which is convergent. Okay, now that's sort of a, a layout of both tests applied to this series. But you can see the thinking behind both approaches. I still had to make a guess about what I thought this series was doing in the beginning. And how did I make my guess? I looked at that 4 over 3 to the n plus 1, and I thought about what would happen if n got very large. And I realized that the plus 1 would really go away and that this guy would really act like 4 over 3 to the n. And so my direct comparison was to that, and my limit comparison was also to that. And when I ran both of those tests, I got conclusions that told me this series is convergent. Okay, let's try some more examples. Let's try the infinite series n equals 1 to infinity 1 over the square root of n. Okay, what should I compare it to, and should I do direct or should I do limit? Well, really, the first issue is what can I compare that to? And the first thing that should be jumping out at you is that actually you already know the answer to this. This is really just one of those p-series. In fact, it's a p-series where p equals 1 half. So actually for this problem, I would be okay with you just saying this is the p-series with p equals 1 half, and we know those diverge. And actually for this one, you wouldn't really have to apply any tests at all. We've already proven that p-series diverge if p is less than or equal to 1. All right, now, just to show you the, to, the, the two tests in action, though, let's see. 1 over square root of n, if I'm going to show that that diverges by doing a direct comparison, then that means what? I need to show 1 over square root of n is bigger than something I know diverges. Okay, what's bigger? than 1 over square root of n that I know diverges. Well, again, how do I make a fraction smaller, which is what I'm doing with this greater than, 
the left side is bigger, the right side smaller. Well, you'd either have to make the numerator smaller, or you'd have to make the denominator bigger. Well, how can you make square root of n bigger? Lots of ways, but an obvious way to do it would be to put an n there, because I know n is bigger than square root of n, as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, so if I left the 1 alone, and I just made the square root of n bigger, then now I know this is smaller than this. Okay, what do I know about the series 1 over n? Well, we've proved that one a long time ago. That diverges. That's the harmonic series. And if this one diverges, and this is bigger, then I know this one also diverges. So I think about things that I could reasonably compare this to. And again, the idea is what? If I know this is 1 over n to the 1 half, uh, what's something really simple I can compare that to? 1 over n. Now, notice something here. There are all kinds of traps you can fall into. Uh, which one of these two is bigger? Well, when n is bigger, n squared is bigger than n to the 1 half, which means 1 over n squared is smaller than 1 over n to the 1 half. Okay, what do I know about the series 1 over n squared? I know that converges. As we set up here, the p series diverges if p is less than or equal to 1 but it converges if p is bigger than 1. Okay, that means this series converges. Well, if I know this one converges, and I know this one over here on the left is bigger than that, um, if this guy is bigger and this one converges, can I reach any conclusion at all about this one? And the answer is no. When you say this one on the right converges, if the one on the left is bigger, well, the question is, is it a lot bigger or only a little bit bigger? If it's a lot bigger, it's probably going to diverge. If it was a little bit bigger, it might converge, but I don't know for sure. All right, so this shows you one of the pitfalls of the direct comparison test. You definitely have to show that what you're trying to test is bigger than something that diverges or that it's less than something that converges. It doesn't do you any good to show that the thing you're testing is less than something that diverges. That doesn't really tell you anything. It wouldn't do you any good to show that the thing you're trying to test is bigger than something that converges. That also doesn't tell you anything. It's got to be one of these two. So be careful with that. Okay, by the way, what about the limit comparison test? Well, again, if I was going to try and compare 1 over the square root of n to something I knew diverged, let's say, because my guess is this diverges, well, what could I compare it to? It would have to be something whose behavior was known to me, and of course 1 over n is a very well-known one. Well, what is that? That's limit n goes to infinity of n over square root of n, which is limit n goes to infinity of square root of n, which is infinity. Okay, if you go back and look at the three cases, and I'll just scroll back here for you. Look at case number three, which is the one that tells us what the interpretation should be if the limit is infinity. Okay, how can I use number three? Well, if the limit is infinity and the bottom series diverges, then I know the top series diverges. Okay, look what we did in our limit comparison. We compared one over square root of n to one over n. And I know the series of 1 over n diverges. And when I compared this one on the top to that 1 over n, I got a limit of infinity.
case number three back in the limit comparison test says that this one in the top would also have to form a series that diverges. Okay, you notice for each one of these I'm, I'm trying to look at what each test would look like and so far in all our examples I'm actually able to use both tests. But as you work through the entire set of problems in the book you'll see some which lend themselves uh, much more easily to using one test over the other. And so as you work through the problems uh, pick the one that you're more comfortable with that seems like it's the easier one and along the way you will be forced to use one test or the other. Uh, so let's keep working and see how that plays out. How about n equals 1 to infinity 1 over n squared plus 2 to the 1 third. Okay again uh, we're getting the idea now before we start thinking about which test to use we should try to make a guess about what we think this acts like or what it compares to when n is large. And the whole trick is what? When I look at something like 1 over n squared plus 2 to the 1 third, I know for sure that when n is very large, an added constant term doesn't really affect the value very much. Meaning, 1 over n squared plus 2 to the 1 third is just about the same as 1 over n squared to the 1 third when n is big and I know that's just 1 over n to the 2 thirds. Okay, what do I know about the series 1 over n to the 2 thirds? That's another p series. It's p equals 2 thirds, which means this series diverges. Okay, so it's really not a guess. I do know by limit comparison, because that's really what we just did right here. We didn't write it up formally, but I know by limit comparison that my series acts like this one and I know that series diverges. So I, I know this one diverges, now it's just a matter of writing it up. Alright, so for the limit comparison test, which would make a lot of sense here because using limits is really how we came up with the 1 over n to the 2 thirds. So when I write up my limit, I will just take the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n squared plus 2 to the 1 third, which is the one I'm investigating, over 1 over n to the 2 thirds, which is the one I'm going to compare it to. Okay, what is that? That's limit n goes to infinity of n to the 2 thirds over n squared plus 2 to the 1 third, which is of course limit as n goes to infinity of n squared over n squared plus 2 to the 1 third. Again, just being pedantic here, I know that that's the limit of something raised to the 1 third, which is the cube root function. I know that cube root function is continuous at all positive numbers, which means I can take that cube root function outside the limit, which means the limit I'm really looking at is the limit of n squared over n squared plus 2, and I know that limit is 1. And so I got a positive finite limit, which tells me what with the limit comparison test, that this series acts the same as this series. And I know this series in the bottom diverges. That means this series diverges. Okay, so limit comparison test, pretty easy for that one. Okay, what about direct comparison? Well, I would have to take 1 over n squared plus 2 to the 1 third and if I'm going to argue that that diverges, then I'm going to have to show that this is bigger than something I know diverges. Now, the question is, can I argue or is it clear that 1 over n squared plus 2 to the 1 third 
is greater than 1 over n to the 2 thirds. Is that obvious? Well, it looks like what I did there is remove the 2 when I went from the left side of the inequality to the right side. When you remove this term, what happens to this expression? It gets smaller. If this gets smaller, then what happens to this fraction? It gets bigger. So actually, 1 over n squared plus 2 to the 1 third is actually smaller than 1 over n to the 2 thirds. Let's just say that 1 over n to the 2 thirds is larger because I'm dividing by something smaller. Okay, but that means the inequality is going the wrong way. Okay, that means this direct comparison is not correct. It really does not show that our series we were after diverges. Now, that just means that the thing I came up with when I did my limit comparison doesn't work out when I try to do direct comparison. That doesn't mean I can't do direct comparison, though. It just means I have to think of something else here to compare this to. Okay, so again, let's go back to the basic strategy. If I'm going to do direct comparison, I have to show that this is larger than something I know diverges. Okay, again, if I'm going to make this fraction on the left smaller, which is what I'm doing here. I'm going from something bigger on the left to something smaller on the right. How do I make this fraction smaller? Well, I make the top smaller or I make the bottom bigger. Well, that means obviously removing the 2 here wasn't the answer because that made that denominator smaller. So how can I make it bigger but still get myself in this direction of something that has an end of the two-thirds in the bottom. Well, it's actually pretty simple, and once I write this, uh, this will click, and you can see that I could apply this in a lot of cases. Okay, do you see that I could definitely write this? That is, do you see that if I replace that 2 by an n squared, then for large n, I am definitely going to make this denominator bigger than this denominator. And if this denominator on the right is bigger, then this fraction on the right is smaller. Okay, what is that thing on the right? It's 1 over 2n squared to the 1 third, which is 1 over 2 to the 1 third times n to the two-thirds. One over two to the one-third is just a constant. It's a constant multiple of one over n to the two-thirds. And I know this guy diverges when I form a series out of it. So if he diverges, and all I have in front of it is a constant, then I know this series diverges. And if this series is bigger than that, this series diverges. So this example is meant to show you that when you're doing a direct comparison, sometimes the thing you have to do a direct comparison to is not precisely the thing you started out with when you were thinking in terms of long-term behavior and limits. I actually needed something a little bit different here. I needed that 2 to the 1 third in there so that I was sure when I went from the left side of this inequality to the right side, that this denominator really was bigger than this denominator. So even though now that you've seen me work this out, this is not really that difficult, you can see that this is a problem where maybe the limit comparison is a little more straightforward. And I would say in most cases, the limit comparison test is probably the easier test. Because if I just think about the long-term behavior of this and eliminate constant terms and take the function that's left over and do an immediate limit comparison to that, I'm probably going to get my answer.
Okay, let's try another one. Um, infinite series 1 plus cosine n over n squared. Okay, now, will direct comparison work? Well, again, the question, I'd have to think about what this acts like when n is big. And, of course, the thing you should be noticing is that since cosine is bounded and just toggles between negative 1 and 1, then what does this, this numerator do? Well, at its smallest, cosine is negative 1, which means that denominator would be 0. And at its largest, that cosine would be 1, which means it would be as big as 2. Okay, that means the top is bounded, and it's always between 0 and 2. But meanwhile, what's happening to the denominator? It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I could really say that 1 plus cosine n over n squared is less than or equal to 2 over n squared and greater than or equal to 0. And the key part there is, if I look at this part, I know this guy converges. I know that is just 2 times infinite series n equals 1 to infinity 1 over n squared, which is convergent p series with p equals 2. Okay, so by direct comparison, I think this is a real easy one. I can immediately say that that converges by direct comparison. Um, now, what about limit comparison? Well, if I was going to compare this to 1 over n squared, that would be 1 plus cosine n over n squared compared to 1 over n squared, since that's the one I'm going to compare it to. Well, that would be limit n goes to infinity of, actually it would leave me with what, 1 plus cosine n? Okay, does that limit even exist? And the answer is no. So here's an example where the so-called limit comparison test actually fails when I try to compare it to this thing I came up with when I was thinking about something simple to direct compare it to. So this is sort of the, the flip of the last example. Here's a case where the direct comparison is very simple, but when I try to use that 1 over n squared to do a limit comparison, I get some weird non-existent limit, which means the limit comparison test doesn't really apply here. So sometimes one test is better than the other, and once in a while one of the tests actually doesn't really work at all for the simple thing that you have in mind. Okay, what about infinite series n plus 1 over n squared square root of n? Okay, and that's a problem from your book, so of course that's the way it's written. Uh, but let's just go ahead and write that denominator as n to the 5 halves. So, of course, if you're catching on to this now, you know that when I'm looking at that function or that sequence there, that I should be mentally deleting that plus 1 so that really I know when n is large, I'm looking at the ratio of n to n to the 5 halves which is 1 over n to the 3 halves. And since 3 halves is bigger than 1, I know that if I was comparing this to the series 1 over n to the 3 halves, I know this is a convergent p series with p equals 3 halves. So my guess is by limit comparison, I should be able to show that this guy converges. And so let's do that quickly. Limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 1 over, let's call it n to the 5 halves, compared to 1 over n to the 3 halves, which is limit n goes to infinity. Okay, if I flip that 1 over n to the 3 halves, let's just write it as n to the 3 halves times n plus 1 over n to the 5 halves, which is limit n goes to infinity.
okay, what happens when I reduce the end of the three halves or the end of the five halves? I get an n in the denominator, and I have a very simple limit of one. Okay, so at this point, I can say by limit comparison test, I know that the series n equals 1 to infinity n plus 1 over n squared squared of n converges by limit comparison. with the series 1 over n to the 3 halves, which I know is convergent p-series. So limit comparison seems pretty straightforward. Uh, what about direct comparison? And again, I only need one of these tests. I'm just, uh, for each one of these, looking at each test to see if they're both doable. So again, I'm thinking about n plus 1 over, let's say, n squared squared of n obviously n to the 5 halves there. If I'm going to show that this guy converges, I would have to show that that's less than something I know converges. Okay, again, back to the usual strategy. How do I make this thing on the left bigger than if I'm looking at that fraction? Then, of course, I have to make the numerator bigger, or I have to make the denominator smaller. All right, now, if what I'm trying to shoot for is something that somehow relates to 1 over n to the 3 halves, uh, the key is something we saw the earlier time we did this sort of a trick. I know I'd like to get rid of that guy because he's really that little term that doesn't make much difference when n gets bigger. And so really when I'm doing this direct comparison, I want to make a comparison that really is more relevant when n gets big. Okay, what is the most obvious way that I can make that numerator bigger and get rid of this 1 in such a way that this new numerator doesn't contain any negligible terms like that? Well, and if you look at the power that I'm after, which is an n to the 3 halves in the bottom, the answer should be pretty obvious if you think about it. If the bottom is an n to the 5 halves, couldn't I replace this 1 by an n? That is, if I replace this 1 by an n, what do I have in that numerator now? I have 2n over n to the 5 halves which is definitely 2 over n to the 3 halves. And again, that is just a multiple of a function that I know makes a convergent series. So we're talking about the infinite series 2 times 1 over n to the 3 halves, which of course is just 2 times infinite series 1 over n to the 3 halves. I know this guy converges, and since this is less than this, I know this guy also converges by direct comparison. So if you look back at the earlier example where I did this sort of a thing, replacing a constant term by an n, this is the second time I've used this trick. So that seems like that would be pretty useful in cases like this if you're trying to do direct comparison. Okay, let's go a little quicker on this one. How about the series 1 over the square root n cubed plus 2? And this is kind of like one we did a few minutes ago. Think about it for a minute and think about what this would be most comparable to in the limit sense. And I'll let you think about it just a second. And if you came up with 1 over n to the 3 halves, that's definitely the right one to be thinking about. Because again, what's that strategy? It's to ignore that constant term and think about how this thing acts when n gets big. And it acts like 1 over n to the 3 halves. So it's the same one that we had in that last example. That's definitely convergent. So, of course, limit comparison would be easy 
just to run through that again, it would be 1 over the square root of n cubed plus 2 over 1 over n to the 3 halves. Uh, make sure you don't fudge with the steps here. That would be limit as n goes to infinity of n to the 3 halves over square root n cubed plus 2, which is limit n goes to infinity of n cubed over n cubed plus 2 square root, which is definitely the square root of limit n goes to infinity n cubed over n cubed plus 2. And I know that limit under that square root is 1. OK, limit comparison test, pretty easy. What about direct comparison? So again, 1 over square root n cubed plus 2. If I'm going to argue that that's convergent, I have to show that's less than something that's convergent. OK, so we're starting to get more used to this now. How do I make that right side bigger? I make the top bigger, or I make the bottom smaller? OK, how can I make the bottom smaller? Well, I could definitely delete any constant additive terms. And if I deleted that too, I would definitely have 1 over the square root of n cubed. But of course, that is just n to the 3 halves. I know this series converges. This is smaller, so this also converges by direct comparison. OK, let's try another one. Infinite series, n equals 1 to infinity, 1 over ln n squared. All right, now, how should I think about this series with that ln in the denominator? Well, I do know one big fact. Uh, if I'm thinking about how ln of n compares to powers of n, because it does seem like my biggest tool here in all of these tests is the p-series. And I do remember that n to the p is faster growing than ln of n for any positive power p. And we proved that back in chapter 6 when we were talking about relative rates of growth. Now when I think about p series, just talking loosely here, I know that the infinite series 1 over n squared converges. But I know when I drop down to 1 over n, that diverges. And I know if I make that power in the n even smaller, then it still diverges. Now, of course, generally speaking, what is it that makes this series converge, whereas this series diverges? Well, the general idea is what? n squared is increasing much faster than n to the 1 half. And when this denominator increases quickly enough, then when you add up these terms in this series, that's how we get this convergence effect. That is where we're stacking the things on the infinite pile, but they're getting so small so quickly that we never reach that limit. We never reach that ceiling. Whereas down here, even though n to the 1 half is getting bigger and bigger, which means 1 over n to the 1 half is getting smaller and smaller, it's not getting small enough fast enough. So that as we add those terms, we are actually adding smaller and smaller terms that still add up to infinity if we add enough of them. All right, putting that all together, the question is, what about ln of n? So let me take the square away for a minute and look at that one. OK, the key is in what I just said. We said ln of n grows more slowly than all of these denominators over here. It grows slower than n squared. It grows slower than n. It grows slower than n to the 1 half. OK, let me repeat this. What is it makes, that makes this first one converge? It's that n squared is increasing fast enough. What is it that makes these two diverge? 
it's that even though these denominators are increasing, they're not increasing fast enough. And what do I know about ln of n? It decreases slower than all three of these powers of n, including the two that are already not increasing fast enough. Okay, that tells me that it's most likely 1 over ln of n diverges. Because if ln of n is growing even slower than n, and I know 1 over n diverges, then it makes sense that 1 over ln of n would also. Okay, now, by the way, what do I know about 1 over square root of n? I know that diverges. Okay, that means if square root of n is growing faster than ln of n, and 1 over square root of n diverges, then 1 over ln of n should also diverge. What happens if I square the square root of n? Then, of course, I get 1 over n, and I know that diverges. Well, that means if I square ln of n, and that grows slower than square root of n squared, which is really n, and I know this one diverges, that means that this one should probably diverge. Okay, so what I'm using here is this fact to reason out that 1 over ln of n squared is most likely divergent because 1 over ln of n squared compared to 1 over n seems like it should be divergent because this is not as growing as fast as this. And even this is not growing fast enough to make the series 1 over n converge. All right, now, does that mean I should do a limit comparison? Let's try limit comparison. And if we're correct here, we're talking about comparing this to 1 over n. What do I get when I take the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over ln n squared over 1 over n? I get limit n goes to infinity n over ln n squared. Okay, what's that? It is infinity over infinity, so I apply L'Hopital's rule, and I get 1 over 2 times ln n times 1 over n, which is limit n goes to infinity of n over 2 ln n. That's still infinity over infinity. Although, again, I do know that n grows faster than ln of n. What do I get when I do L'Hopital's again? I get 1 over 2 times 1 over n, which means I get limit n goes to infinity n over 2. Now, that is infinity, and I do know that the series comprised of 1 over n's diverges. By case 3 of the limit comparison test, if the denominator diverges and this limit goes to infinity, this series comprised of the 1 over ln n squares also diverges. Okay, now, that's a lot of messing around there. And maybe I should be thinking about direct comparison. So 1 over ln of n squared. If I was going to do direct comparison and I thought that this guy diverged, then I would want to show that he's bigger than something that diverges. And again, how do I do that? I try and make a fraction that's smaller, which means the numerator gets smaller or the denominator gets bigger. Well, again, what do I know about ln of n versus n? I know n is the bigger one for sufficiently large n. So I could certainly say that this is bigger than 1 over n squared. And that would be a true statement. OK, but does that help me? the series 1 over n squared converges. But knowing something is bigger than something that converges doesn't tell me anything about this one. OK, what else do I know? Well, if you think about what we just did a minute ago with the limit comparison test, I know that ln of n is also 
less than the square root of n. I know any positive power of n is always bigger than ln of n in the long run. Okay, that means ln of n squared is less than square root of n squared, which is n. Or in other words, 1 over ln of n squared is bigger than 1 over n. And by direct comparison, if I know the series of 1 over n's diverges, and I know 1 over ln n squared is bigger, then that tells me the series of 1 over ln of n squared diverges. So whichever way I did it here, I still had to use the 1 over n. But this is a case, I think, where the direct comparison is a little more straightforward. Okay, let's do just one last example. Let's look at the series nth root of n over n squared. All right, now, again, how, how do we usually start these? We try and get an idea of what this sequence or this function that makes up the terms in this series is doing when n gets big. And, of course, I see the 1 over n squared there. That is, I see the n squared in the bottom, and I know that guy converges if I make a series out of him. The question is, what is this nth root of n thing doing? And so what is the limit as n goes to infinity of that? And you've done that problem in your homework at least a couple of times. If you go back to confirm this, you'll see that that limit is 1. Okay, so that means what? In the limit comparison test, I know that the nth root of n over n squared is about the same or is close to 1 over n squared. So I think it would make sense to do a limit comparison and I'll compare the nth root of n over n squared to 1 over n squared. And of course that simply becomes limit as n goes to infinity of nth root of n, which is just 1, which is a positive finite constant. Therefore, the infinite series nth root of n over n squared acts like, in the convergence sense, infinite series 1 over n squared, which converges. Therefore, our series converges. Okay, that gives you several examples to work with. I've tried to do a good assortment there. So hopefully you've got some good ideas from these examples. Uh, it's a good place to stop, and let me know if you have any questions.